The name Perkins carved in stone, below a gothic tower a boy navigates with a cane. A title graphic, Perkins presents The Role of the Emotional Brain with Jan van Dyke. I think the biggest improvements and the new insights come from the field of neurobiology. Uh, since we, the scientists are able, let's say, to look into the brain and see with what kind of uh, activity, what part of the brain is, is involved. The discovery of new neurons, they, they've never uh, thought of, let's say, uh, later than 10 years ago. And studying these, uh, these things, you can relate them to the intuition, which is the basis of sciences, the intuition, and as you said, observation. I observed certain behavior traits in, in children, and I picked them up and worked on them, but I never understood why it was so important. So in my early uh, publications, there are a lot of intuitive type of things, which I did and were successful. And a lot of people all over the world tried to do the same thing, imitated it, and found a way in all sorts of curricula. But I never understood why this and this was so effective until adjacent fields of science said, hey, fellow, that is what you are looking for. So what I try to do is to bridge the gap between what's out there in the medical field and in the field of neurobiology and even in chemistry and the daily practice. And I think with my experience, and um, I, I hope to bridge the gap and that new approaches are profiting from this uh, new findings. Fade to black. A graphic of the Perkins logo swoops across the screen revealing a chapter heading, the limbic system. We are so focused on cognition, developing of concept, developing of language, developing. And I must confess, in my early work was on communication because, and I hope that I'm not, no, not cursing in the church. We were th I was thinking too, when these kids, when these people have language, when they can communicate, they are fine. But then I saw very fine deaf blind and people communicating very well, but they were very unhappy. They were depressed, they had a lot of stress, so gradually, I found also that cognition without emotions is a dichotomous uh, assumption. We really should go back and introduce again the total human being, including his emotions. But if you look into all the curriculum, even mine, and here, you know, there is formulation of concepts, uh, communication, signing, but about emotions, you won't find anything. About laughing, about crying, and particularly about joy. Why? We always talk about quality of life. What, that's what we all want. All parents want good quality of life for the kids. Is that 30,000 words? Is that um, mathematician, m uh, mathematics? No, it is to be a positive person. When are you becoming, when are you a positive person? When, when are you a happy person? And I have a very simple definition. That are when you have in your life moments of joy. Think about it. In a video clip, Dr. Jan van Dyck sits next to a young boy who is in a wheelchair. The boy is nonverbal and has some visual impairment. 
Dr. Van Dyke is speaking to the boy in Dutch. At one point, the boy sits up quickly. Dr. Van Dyke laughs enthusiastically, and the boy shares the laugh and smiles broadly. <laughs> when were you happy? When somebody really, when you are sad, put his arms on yours. Not all big words, but just being with you. That you felt the empathy, the sympathy of that person. When a mother received the smile of a child. When the child receives the smile of the mother. Then you see the excitement. Then you see the joy. That is what we all want, quality of life. And that quality of life is not mainly in the higher structures of the cortical area, but are the connections deep in the brain. And deep in the brain, there are areas which, when we do something, gives us rewards. And when we are anxious and we can think over our anxiety, we relax. The areas to which Dr. Van Dyke is referring are known as the limbic system. In a computer-generated illustration of the human brain, the various structures of the limbic system are shown in the location where they are found relative to the cerebral cortex. So gradually, I came to learn that we skip, that we forget the most existential part of the human being, emotions. By the same token, I have seen so many children and adults now, where cognition, well, is so limited. And people go on and on and on and try year after year after year hitting the same rock. But nothing happens. Only that person becomes more frustrated, unhappier than he always have been before. Looking to those persons, my question was, how can you still invest in these persons that they experience moments of joy? To be with them, to smile with them, to touch them, to attune to them. And we know now from the research on mother-child interaction that chemicals are released in the brain, which gives that very pleasant feelings. In a video clip, an infant is resting face up on her mother's thighs. The mother opens and closes her fist in the child's field of vision. Careful observation of the child's eyes discloses the infant is looking alternately at the hand and then back to her mother's face. Now, in good attunement with a child, these positive feelings are released on the basis of chemicals, oxycetin, endorphins, which makes it rewarding for the educator to be with that child and which makes it rewarding for that person. And that are the moments of optimal joy. On this limbic system, you will see a little child living across me seven weeks, and you see the mother interacting and smiling and putting out her tongue, and with seven weeks, and then she moves her hand, and with seven weeks, the child put on the hand. And there is such a tremendous joy between both of them that I said, my gosh, if we see this grown up and adults or children with little potential, we still, we still are able, when we consider that whole limbic area, the good memories of rewards, the good memories of really attuned contact, we might contribute significantly 
to their quality of life. So that is, that is an approach which gives so much hope and perspective even for children who fail cognitively. Fade to black. A graphic of the Perkins logo swoops across the screen revealing a chapter heading, Stress. Are we not for a long time excusing ourselves by looking, by accusing the brain and really not knowing what the brain actually contributes to that behavior? My challenge is that uh, even when the brain has structures which are, not, which are abnormal and this dysfunction, that the way the environment deals with it predicts to a large extent the outcome of that person. And that brings me to a point which I would like to put forward very much, and that's about stress. In a video clip of the young boy in the wheelchair, we see Dr. Van Dyke gently stroking the boy's hand. The boy moves his hand away slightly, and Dr. Van Dyke reaches out further to continue stroking. Suddenly, the boy pulls his hand away and arches back into his chair. To put it a little bit provocative is that we as persons, educators, we cause very often very much stress in our children. And stress is the most hideous thing a person can have. The thing now is that we can measure the stress. And as a scientist, you should be surprised. Well, I'm surprised the whole day. I'm the most surprised of my own mistakes. I said, that child's not under stress. He can do that. He can take that. But now we are able to measure it by measuring the cortisol level. And then we see, and this is done, and then we see that the stress patterns of these children are completely different from normal stress patterns. In a video clip, Dr. Van Dyke sits on a couch facing a young girl in a wheelchair who is visually impaired and nonverbal. He holds her right hand in his left and asks her for her other hand, which rests on the arm of her wheelchair. When the girl does not respond, he brushes her hand and gently attempts to lift it. She pulls her hand up and away. Some of them have a continuously high level of stress during the day. And when there is continuously stress, it breaks down all new developments in neural networks. So in education, my slogan is, you try to put it down, you try to put it up, but in fact, you're knocking it down. If you look with your eyes of the stress model to education, to education, then the effect of what a teacher does with that impaired child is as limited as 5%. In a video clip, Dr. Van Dyke is laughing and talking with the boy in the wheelchair. As the boy begins to swing his arm in a wiping motion, a self-soothing behavior, Dr. Van Dyke begins to sing in rhythm with the boy's arm motion. My son and I did a study on one child interacting with a teacher of experience of 20 years experience in this field. And he was um, known as a good teacher. And we broke up all the interactions with hundreds and hundreds of bits. 
at the moments they were really attuned of all this small observation was 5%. It was 5%. And you saw a lot of self-abuse. You saw a lot of irritation in the child. Because suppose that we are talking now, that there would be complete misunderstanding, that you are thinking, I don't understand what he's talking about. And I'm thinking, I don't understand this question. You know what's going on here. You know, gradually the irritation would grow between us. Yeah. Suppose that would happen during 24 hours of the day, then all learning and all development would just be at stake. So the main issue is how can we refrain from stress? In a video clip, Dr. Van Dyke sits beside the boy who was in a wheelchair. After spending time together, Dr. Van Dyke now recognizes that when the boy blinks repeatedly, it is a sign that he is enjoying the activity. Dr. Van Dyke acknowledges to the boy that he sees him blinking, and the boy appears pleased and happy. How can we, me as an educator, as a parent, as a teacher, and with a child, do it in such a way that there is time of relaxation, to absorb the information, to take initiative that the adult is responsive, that there is a real dialogue going on. Fade to black. A graphic of the Perkins logo swoops across the screen revealing a chapter heading, Mirror Neurons. In the human nature, there is a brain system which interprets mutual emotions, right? Particular positive emotions, and that's the positive emotions. They are stored in the amygdala, the positive emotions, smiling. Negative emotion, the child turns away, the positive emotions. So there is a system which at the subcortical level, not conscious, anything at all, all deep happening in the brain, mirrors the emotions at a very early stage of the, other, of the adult. It mirrors the emotions in which vision, the face, the smile, as I said, the feelings of warmth, which releases oxycetin in both mother and child. So right from the beginning, emotions are attuned. And I have called that <laughs> resonance, because you resonate. I, f I felt that. I felt that. When, when I did this, and the kid felt it, you know, he joined in with this type of activity. I mean, this, this. So, at a very low, uh, let's say, primitive uh, level of the brain, we we can mirror each other's actions and emotions. That has opened up for me a whole pool of thoughts and um, because if I'm right, that's so important that my face and my emotions are mirrored in the other person. In a video clip, the young boy in the wheelchair turns his head to the left to face Dr. Van Dyke, who responds by leaning closer to the boy. This is the initiation of an interaction much like a game of peekaboo, which the two share. Yeah. <laughs> that is contact. Again, I would uh, refer you to that uh, little girl, seven weeks, Nova, 
and you will see a Nova, and I'm playing there, ask the mother to play with mirror neurons. And the mother smiles, and you see the smile on the child's face. The mother put out the tongue, and the child put out the tongue. <laughs> In a video clip, we see the infant Nova and her mother. As Nova's mother sticks her tongue out, we can see Nova imitate her mother, sticking out her own tongue. What about being blind? Okay. And true. We, we have some evidence that in children who have no face recognition, and face recognition, of course, so important, even when you are, what we say, blind, that's not, again, a good concept in this framework. We should say, does the child has any face recognition? Even when the doctor says blind, I still can say, does the child perceive we say that, the contours, yeah, of my face. Well, there is research showing that a significant difference between blind kids, blind kids who still can recognize the changing face and the ones who cannot. In a video clip, a father sits facing his daughter who is in a wheelchair. The father leans in closely to engage the young woman, who is visually impaired and nonverbal, and they gaze at one another. When the girl's head drops towards her chest, her father raises his finger to his mouth in a shushing motion. She responds by lifting her head up and raising her right arm towards his face. When a blind child, a deaf blind child, has no mirror neurons, that whole system does not develop. On this system, our emotional system is built up. Okay. How should I go then? Just say, let's say, 70% of those children are emotionally very shallow. How could I compensate for that? For by touch. By touch. Are the mirror neurons for touch? For hearing, we know. Yep. For vision, we know about touch. It has to be. When they are for vision, when they are for touch, they must be, or for hearing, they must also be there for touch. Probably they are all spread out in our nervous system. So the challenge for when people accept this, this framework of thinking, the challenge would be for getting the whole limbic system, the emotional system going, to look very intensively how you can mirror your emotions via touch. In a video clip, Dr. Van Dyke sits facing the young woman in the wheelchair. Their right hands rest together palm to palm, and Dr. Van Dyke moves them back and forth rhythmically. When the young woman stops following his motions, Dr. Van Dyke gently taps her palm in an attempt to re-engage. She imitates the gesture and the two now clap together. And that, that would be, when I have to set up an early intervention program, I would sit around the team and say, okay, how could we, with emotions, stressing by touching, by moving along, perhaps using also the other senses, how could we 
mirror our mutual emotions when the child approaches me and you approach the child having the same way of touching, how would we go about that? I think that would be, that would be the solution of, uh, of many emotional problems in this, uh, in this children. Fade to black. A graphic of the Perkins logo swoops across the screen revealing a chapter heading, Challenging Behavior. Now knowing about the limbic system, how easily you can stir up very intensive emotions, and at a long run, the behavior comes back again. I think we have to supplement uh, behavioral approach by attachment approach. Do we have an approach? And then still in play intervention, in positive approach and getting into attunement. Finding a way that you can release that rewarding chemical. That's the best rewards and not the token. In a video clip, we see the close-up of a young boy's hands resting on a tray, which is attached to the arms of his wheelchair. Dr. Van Dyke's hand is also visible as he prompts and encourages the boy to imitate his movements. As the shot pulls out, we see the boy blinking repeatedly, a sign he is enjoying the interaction. A smile crosses his face. Complementary approaches gives, first of all, a more human, humanistic attitude towards this behavior. Because very often, this behavior message fails because parents and teachers don't want to do that. When you do overcorrection, you know, the, the child has spit on the floor and has to pick it up and pick it up and pick it up and pick it up. I've seen it, all these things. And uh, that goes against human empathy for other human beings. And that's why it fails often. Not in the eyes of the clinician, but the child should live or that person should live in a normal circumstance. What is the problem with the amygdala is <coughs> that when you have one negative experience, as it were, it's spread out to, to all sorts of things we, we cannot trace. In a graphic illustration of the brain, the amygdala is shown in its relative location and highlighted in blue. Let's say the child is hit like this, even when a branch branch of the tree is moving like that, she's like that. So that is, <coughs> that is why traumatic experiences, traumatic experience really can, we all know about sexual abuse. Uh, one traumatic experience can ruin your whole life. Oh, but this is only a sexual thing. No, it is broad, every association area because the amygdala protects us from being destroyed, yeah? It is the, the organ which detects fears to save ourselves. So not only fear, but it can be, so that's why it has developed in mankind and also in, in animals that when something is a little bit similar to what they have experienced, back off, you know? And that's why, um, abuse, and sometimes, let's say, uh, operations that you'll have to go on, or separations, or martial discord, but a particular abuse can really destroy, I mean, you have to restore trust again. That's trust, 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 trust. But the amygdala is a very strong, strong thing, so we must have consistency in handling. So that is why uh, we, we have so much, according to my simple opinion, to change our thinking 
or to deepen our thinking of, of human beings who are, are bereft by their senses and sometimes of a good, warm environment. Because if that environment is not fully supportive, then their life is based on, on very little, right? Yeah. So that's, in this way, I see uh, challenging behaviors. Fade to black. A graphic of the Perkins logo swoops across the screen, revealing a chapter heading, Evidence-Based Practice. There is one key now, which I learned for the, also over the last years, that's evidence-based practice. Evidence-based is that we have studies now, and it's interesting, by a colleague, uh, Professor Janssen, Marlene Janssen, I work with very closely, and she was looking to challenging behaviors, stressful children, or children who are very passive. We all know that, you know, when they have to put on the socks, they lift up their feet and you have to knock them. And lift their feet. Yeah, we don't do anything and sit there and rock. When she analyzed this behavior, she looked to the teacher's approach. And as I said, they miss out completely. The moment the child wants to do any initiative, the teacher looks away. Or you know, when the child leans back, the teacher does not interpret that. The child wants to interpret the situation, but poof, jumps at it because that emptiness is felt as a negative thing. Analyzing this behavior, discussing it with the teachers, either on an individual basis or within a group, keeping notes to the whole protocol. And by doing this, 10 sessions of one hour and a half, Nothing doing anything on the child, no, nothing, but just changing teacher's behavior. You saw that the target behavior in the child either diminished when it was challenging behavior or more initiative, more in a very significant way. In a video clip, a woman attempts to feed a boy who is in a wheelchair. The boy seems more interested in a self-soothing behavior, moving his right arm in a wiping motion, than in the food the woman offers with a fork. When she interrupts the motion, grabbing his arm, he attempts to push the fork away with his left hand. In a clip taken some time later, the woman is now encouraging the boy, tapping his hand. When the boy responds by opening his hand, she grasps it, and together they engage in the wiping motion. So. The big hope is that when we focus on parent and teacher training, that with a limited amount of time, you can, by changing that behavior, not looking to the child, but only focusing on the teacher's behavior, the target behavior in the child, become significantly better. And that's, um, that's a, a, um, a tendency, uh, a finding which can repeat it over and over again. So I think that when we approach our problems with the new insights we have gained over the years, some significant gains can be reached. More interesting is, that after you say goodbye to the teacher and you do your follow-up, the teacher regresses to what he did before. But the child keeps his gains longer than the teacher. So 
like you have to go with your car for lubrification to the garage, the teacher, the parents need continuously, continuously further training, help, supervision, so forth. So that's the fascinating thing, that we can reduce stress, that we can uh, learning a more pleasant thing, more a motivational thing, by just changing the interaction between the educator and, uh, and the child. And that is evidence-based. Fade to black.